Wow. So, I, so when I went to that church, like they, they rolled out the red carpet for me and, and, and it was well known. Like that's, you know, that's the Bishop's spiritual grandson right there. Mm. And it was well known, like who I am. Um, and they were kind of grooming me to be that, to be that guy. Hey everybody, welcome to Contra Talk. My name is Richard Henry and my guest today is Joe Bahoda. Uh, he is a husband and a father, he's a fellow YouTuber, and we're gonna talk about his coming to Christ, we're gonna talk about his military background and a bunch of other wonderful things, his reason for being on YouTube and all that. So yeah, w welcome to uh, the show, Joe, how are you doing? Oh, thanks Richard, I'm um, doing well, and thank you so much for having me, I really, really appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely, thanks for, thanks for coming on and sharing some time. Uh, why don't you just kind of flesh out just first who you are, I know you're, you're a husband and a father, um, yep. I know you were served in four uh, tours in uh, yep. the military. You've been in the military for 20 some odd years. Um, why don't you just talk a little bit about that? What brought you into the military, how you came to Christ and, and. Sure. Well, like you said, I'm a husband and a father. I um, live here in North Carolina with my wife and four kids and we'll soon to be four kids because uh, we have two and we're in the process of adopting two more. So hopefully in the next couple of months, we'll get some word on that. Um, but yeah, uh, came to Christ in 96. So been doing this, so, you know, about 25 years or so, this Christian walk. And as I've been growing in the Lord, the Lord eventually, you know, called me to preach. And I gave my first sermon in Korea, uh, in Seoul, Korea in 2001. It was a watch night service, 2001 going into 2002. And uh, so I've been preaching now since then. And um but that being said, I did 20 years in the army. So I got saved in the army. I actually got saved in, I don't know if, if you know, NTC national training center. It's like in the Mojave desert of California. So it's the middle of nowhere, 120 some degrees, whatever, smoking hot. And I actually got separated from my unit on purpose. So I didn't get lost in the desert, but I actually got transferred to another unit in this particular two weeks in the box. They call it when you actually like pretend to be at war in the training and I had to be uh, attached to another unit and it was just me and this other guy and this other guy happened to be saved. So in our downtime, he would like read his Bible and stuff like that. And then, and it just so happens I was stationed out of Alaska and they were stationed at a Fort Stewart, Georgia. And, um, you know, I just, in our downtime, I would ask him questions because I was, when I was in Alaska, I started going back to church again. I was like 19 years old at the time. So I started going back to church again and just, but I didn't really know too much. I knew about the Bible, like Noah's Ark and stuff like that. Just small sure. little stories, but nothing yeah. major. Anyway, make a long story short. Um, he basically told me how to get saved and all that. And then, you know, he went over the hill to go use the bathroom, dug a hole. <laughs> and um, and while he was gone, I, I gave my life to the Lord. I prayed and I, wow. I, got, I was in the scriptures and, and ever since then, that was November 7th, 96. I'll never mm. forget that day. And uh, and then here we are. And uh, and then through then, I mean, in the four combat tours, I pastored on my first tour in Iraq. Um, and I've been, you know, just doing this thing. I'm a chaplain now, so I've been doing this thing a while. So, um, yeah, that's me. I've been on YouTube now for about eight years, um, but not too many people know about it or know me because it's. I wasn't very consistent with it with it because I couldn't be because of my time in Afghanistan and Iraq and sure. just all the training exercises. I, I couldn't make videos be consistent, but I finally retired from 20 years uh, in 2015. So uh, around 2016, I got a little bit more active in it. And then I'd say in the last six months or so, I've really been, you know, a lot more. I just is something I want to grow and something I want to do. So. Yeah. Well, no, appreciate your service. Thank you so much. I know sometimes people have military different differing military views and and mm -hmm. i'm we can all talk about the military industrial complex but generally it's soldiers like you that go in for all the right reasons um yeah. and you know sacrificing much time and energy and uh, often you know injury and even life um yeah. so but I'm, I'm very thankful and maybe not everybody is but i certainly am so thank you for that well, thank you i appreciate um, that and it's great and it's, it's i mean i love that story i mean it's just I love testimonies because you, you hear just a different perspective and a different 
angle on how Christ changes you and how right. the Lord Jesus is, is better in every way. So that's, that's good. You said you're in North Carolina. Is that right? Yeah. I'm North Carolina. We moved here. We, in 2016, we actually came from the Seattle, Washington area. So we actually moved all the way across country. Wow. Uh, me and my, my wife, we met at a church. Uh, I was in station at Fort Lewis, Washington. So we met at a church near Fort Lewis. And then in 2016, we packed up the U-Haul and, and came across the, the United States in, around August of 2016. So been here ever since. Wow. And so you're a full-time chaplain. That's correct. Well, I, I work part-time. Yeah. But okay. that, but, yeah, but I, I'm full-time duty, if you will. But yeah, as far as hourly, yeah, it's part-time, but yeah, I'm actually a chaplain. Okay. So okay. that's what I do. I, I get provide us pastoral care for not only the, the clients we serve, but also the staff and everybody that does the organization that I work for. So, yeah. Okay. And what was, I'm just always curious, what, what took you to the military? What made you say, I want to, I want to give my life to this. Um, at, least, at least a portion of my, your no, life. I, I wish I would have some great spiritual, hardcore answer. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, we you were, weren't a Christian then, so it could be just. No, I was. You know, I wanted to go. Right, I wanted exactly, to go fire right. guns. I wanted to travel. I wanted to go meet girls and you know, yeah. far off lands. And, you um, know, there's lots of. It, it's uh, no, it's definitely more simpler than that. Though. Uh, my family was dirt poor, <laughs> and um, yeah, and I was working two jobs, kind of like Kmart, and when Kmart was big back then, right? Yeah. Um, uh, Kmart and uh, Arthur Treacher's, which is like a Long John Silver's type, of, like fish re- fast food place. And I was working in two jobs and and my family lived, my mom and dad, God bless them, but they lived in the middle of nowhere. And so it, it'd be like a 20, you know, 20 mile drive just to get to town. So all the money I was making was basically going in gas and insurance on my car and all that. So I wasn't getting ahead yeah. at all. I was 19 years old and I'm like, okay, I have no money. I have really have no prospects. I'm not going to college. I don't have a degree. Now, thank God I have, I got my associates, bachelors and masters all in active duty. Wow. Um, But at the time I didn't have any of that. And so I was like, I have no prospects. I'm 19. What do I do? And I actually joined the, I wanted to join the air force first, but I was, I was a chunky kid. And uh, so I was actually too fat to get in the Air Force. So I went to the Army and they're like, no problem. You know, we'll run it off you. Come on in. <laughs> so I, I joined the Army about a month or two later and in, in December of 95. And I got out in December 2015. So I mm. did 20 years. So that that's why I, I joined just because, you know, we were dirt poor and I couldn't afford to go to college anymore. I, I did go to college for like one semester. Yeah. Uh, and then I dropped out and that was that. Yeah. No, I mean, it's, it's, everybody has a story. Everybody has, you know, the reason for doing X, Y, or Z. No, that's good. Um, what then took you, so you said you've been on YouTube for a while, but you've been really yeah. inconsistent. What prompted you to, to jump on YouTube way back when and, and kind of what deterred you? I'm always curious what deterred you from kind of, I mean, I know you mentioned, I guess, some of the active duty still, uh, but what was your reason for, for getting on YouTube to begin with? Um, a couple of things. Number one, I came out of the prosperity gospel, word of faith, name it and claim it, speak it into existence. God wants you rich. Mm-hmm. You know, we're all going to be millionaires um, type of churches. And around, I'd say around 2006, 2007, the Lord really like big time started showing me how dramatically wrong all that was. Mm. Um, when I was stationed in Hawaii, um, there was a university cause I wanted to get my degree and I wanted to get my degree in biblical studies. And it just so happens they had Wayland Baptist university, which was in Hawaii. That was one of the branch campuses in Hawaii that they had. So I got mm. my bachelor's and eventually got my master's, um, through them in, uh, you know, Christian ministry. So like biblical interpretation, hermeneutics, preaching, all that kind of stuff. Nice. And, as I was taking these classes, I realized when they were properly showing me how to, you know, you know, preach and teach a scripture in context, my whole life in the word of faith movement was wrong. Now, with that being said, I was actually ordained as an elder in a word of faith church. When I pastored in my first tour, I, I was an elder. I pastored as a word of faith pastor. <laughs> wow. Um, so wow. that, that was my upbringing. That's, you know, so that's what I did. And the church was about, and I'm not saying this to brag. I'm just saying what God did for me. Now it, keep in mind that the grace and the mercy of God, here I am a word of faith pastor, pastoring soldiers in Iraq. And the church was about 300. Yeah. And 
I was tore up from the floor, <laughs> you know, so, um, but God showed me a lot of those verses were preached out of context. They were taught out of context. So, mm. and then, so officially I came out of the word of faith movement and, and now I hold no ill will as far as I love my friends. I love the people that befriended me. I mean, I love them, but I officially came out of the movement in 2011. Okay. And, but then it was like, when I came out, I got shunned. If you will, I feel wow. like it felt like I was put in a cave and they put a big old stone in front of the cave and they wouldn't let me out. And mm. I, I felt like that for a long time. Like I lost a lot of connections, a lot of the the networks I had, a lot of the friends I had, all that was basically like taken away from me when I came out of the movement. It's like all the support I once had, I didn't have anymore. Wow. And, but I'm like, but I have like a testimony. I have a message. I, like I know stuff and I want to tell people like how messed up, like some of that stuff is. And I actually, if you don't mind, I actually wrote two books. Yeah, on, no, sure. Yeah, absolutely. That are on, here we go. Holiness. Can the church do this or not? That's the first book I wrote because like all title. these scandals and, and I, and I wrote that book in 2009. Cause like all the sexual scandals and all the, the, the financial scandals and and in the second book, I wrote this one two years later in 2011 called Word of Faith Preachers, How Misinterpretation of Scripture Might Lead You Astray. And I wrote that one in Iraq. And because God was just showing me like all the stuff they were preaching and all the stuff that they were saying and doing, like it just wasn't right. So in this book right here, Word of Faith Preachers, I, I expose all that. And I, I talk about like all the verses they preach at a context. Well, not all, but a lot of the verses they preach at a context and and I, what I do is I say, okay, this is what they're saying. And then this is what the scripture actually means. And so I give a, you know, like a compare and contrast. So people, when they read the book, they can see what is actually going on. And so I just had all of this like stuff inside of me, if you will. And I just had to get it out. And not too many people were reading the book and getting the book. So I was like, well, I still have all this information. How do I get it out? Mm. So about eight years ago, I got on YouTube. And then here's the other thing too, when all your friends and circles or word of faith and prosperity churches they don't want to listen to you anymore they don't want you to come in and tell them how wrong and jacked up their theology is so it's like i have this word in me but who do i tell because nobody wants to listen to me at least not in the circles that i came from so it's like i don't i don't know what to do now so i was like well let me get on youtube and let me just start doing that so about you know I guess it was about 2013, 14, somewhere around there. I got on YouTube and about eight years ago and I've been on there ever since. So that's yeah. how it got started for me. No, that's good. That's good. Um, how often do you, how often are you on, uh, is it weekly, monthly, a couple times a week? What, no, I, what, right what, now what would somebody week. expect, expect if they, yeah. when they go to your channel? Yeah, right now I'm on weekly. My goal is to do a, at least one video a week. Um, okay. I want to be consistent with this. You know, that's what was so hard for me in the past. You know, when you're in Iraq, Afghanistan, like we talked about earlier, like you can't really make videos when you're in combat. Right. So a lot of people didn't know me. And even if they did, I wasn't consistent because my job just wouldn't let me do it. Mm -hmm. um, but now that I have a little more time, I, my goal is to do at least one video a week. Um, and thankfully, I already have about two or three videos that I want to do that are lined up. You know, after this one, I have like a little quick, you know, Resurrection Sunday uh, you know, resurrection day coming up that I want to do. And there's a couple other ones I have to do that. So anyway, to answer your question, at least one video a week, that's my goal is what I want to do. Yeah. Let's go back to the chaplaincy for a second. I'm always curious. <laughs> what, what, what is the day in the life of a chaplain really look like? I know you said it's part-time, even if it's full-time or volunteer or whatever. Right. Cause I, I do have another friend. I, I, we haven't talked lately cause he's been a chaplain for a few years now and we haven't talked much, uh, since he's been chaplain, but tell somebody, cause I've always been a little curious myself. What, what's, what's a chaplain do besides obviously, you know, I mean, I guess maybe that'd be for a pastor too. And I might answer the question similar, <laughs> but what do you got? Well, it, it's a lot of pastoral similar experiences and duties. The only difference is you don't have like, Oh, I go to a church building on Sunday. Um, so our organization, we actually call ourselves a Christian church without walls. You know, that's our mantra. Um, but you still do all the pastoral duties that a lot of pastors would do. Um, you know, particularly in the last couple of years with COVID and everything, like people have, you know, gr so grief counseling, um, you know, people have lost loved ones like myself. I lost my mom last year in September, um, due to COVID. So a lot of people have lost loved ones or they've been sick. 
they've been ill. Uh, there's been a lot of depression, anxiety, um, you know, loneliness. Um, and when you go to work every day, you might not be at your best because you've got a lot of a lot of stuff, a lot of baggage you're carrying, particularly with kids. And then schools were closed and virtual schooling and daycares were shut down. And when the first happened, that you know, the government shut everything down, like people lost their jobs. Like so you got financial stress, you got kids stress, you got people dying. I mean, it's just a mess. So how do you do pastoral care for all of that? How do you do pastoral care for those staff members? Um, how do you do, you know, we have clients we support. How do you provide pastoral cat staff and um, for the clients and pastoral care for those? Um, so that's kind of what I do. So not only do I give them, you know, the regular Bible studies or, you know, could we still do, you know, we, uh, services. So we still give them, you know, the services. Uh -huh. um, but in addition to that, there's a lot of counseling, if you will. Um, okay. A lot of, you know, how do you, how do you deal with life? And, and, but since I am a Christian chaplain, how do you do it through a Christian biblical perspective yeah. and still give them that pastoral care that they need, even though since we're not a Christian church, where like everybody in there is Christian, if you will, mm -hmm. how do you do that when you have many different faiths or they may be very weak in their Christian faith, or in some cases, no faith at all. Yeah. Uh, can you still give them that, you know, biblical counseling and give them the truth to where that blesses them? And it, again, it just, you know, it maybe drops a seed to where it can give, you know, a light for Christ so they can receive Christ later on um, to where you can bless somebody and give them the wisdom that comes from God's word. Uh, so that way it blesses them. So you still do pastoral care. It's just not in a traditional sense of, hey, I'm going to a church building on Sunday and I'm going to listen to the pastor for an hour. Mm hmm. Um, it's, it's a lot more, um, hands-on and boots on the ground, if you will, because they're not actually coming to a pulpit. They're not coming to you. You go to them and you minister to where they are and you give them, you know, the word of God. Now, granted with COVID a lot more of that ministering has been virtually. Okay. Um, but yeah, that's just kind of like a day in a life where I, I go to them and I minister to them where they're at, give them the word of God and giving them pastoral care sure. instead of them coming to a building. Now, does that, I guess, do they, people generally reach out in situations like that? Or oh, yeah. is it, you, okay. It's, 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 it's give and take. It's both. I've had okay. people, you know, cause they give you a cell number and obviously people have your email. So I've had people email me. I've had people, you know, text me saying, Hey, Chaplain Joe, I need to get a hold of you. Um, I'm struggling with a, B or C I, I need your advice, or I just need you. I, I feel like I'm losing my mind. I need you to talk yeah. to somebody about this, or I don't know what to do. So I just need somebody to just to kind of, you know, bounce this off of. And then there's other times where I will just, you know, sometimes go to their offices or I just, you know, I would call them and say, hey, how's everybody doing? And then once you do that, then you kind of get like the floodgates. It's like, well, I need to talk to you, you know, because yeah. I'm in their area. Yeah. So sometimes when you go to their offices and they see physically see that you're there, then it's like the floodgates open. It's like sometimes people don't want to talk to you until you make an effort to talk to them. Mm, yeah. And then once they sure. see you, then it's like. Oh, I, uh, now that you're here, let me talk to you. And then that's when the floodgates open. But this is that's a good thing in this case. Yeah. Because um, people really are want to share what they're going through. And that's when you can really minister to their pain. Absolutely. No, that's good. Um, so do you have then, I know, you, obviously, like you're saying, let's go mostly go out to people. And uh, there's kind of a, a network that way. Do you have like a church that you preach at or like a building place on Sunday as well that people come to or no? No, not, no. I preach at my, where I work at and I preach okay. on, we do ours on Wednesdays. Gotcha. Um, yeah. So I, I preach on Wednesdays at my, uh, it, we, we call ourselves, we are a legalized church, but it's not a church. I get in a traditional sense. We, we go to work. Right. Yeah, and then yeah. we, so I preach from my work. Yeah. Okay. And we do yeah. that on Wednesdays. And you mentioned clients. Is that, are those like military people or just like, I, yeah, I well, know. they're, they're homeless veterans. They're homeless. Oh, veterans. I gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Got it. I was just, and me being, I, me I, being I know, I know years. very little. Sorry. No, yeah, no problem. And me being a home, not homeless, me being a veteran myself, that was kind of like a win-win. Yeah. Um, you know, cause I can relate to not all, but I can relate to some of the stuff they're going through because either I've seen it, heard it, experienced it myself being a 20 year veteran. So, yeah. and I wasn't a chaplain in the army either. Just by the way, I, people are like, oh, well, really? you were a pastor. Okay. yeah, okay. people are I like, well, you were a pastor. 
in the army. Yeah, I, I served as a pastor, but I was not a chaplain. I was actually a ammunition guy. <laughs> so, oh, okay. Yeah. So, yeah. So I actually like gave the bullets and the bombs and the hellfire missiles to the good guys so we could go kill the bad guys. Yeah. Um, that was my job. I supplied the supply chain with the ammunition. So I wasn't, you know, because chaplains in the army, they're not allowed to have weapons. Um, I was you know, going to say, yeah, I was curious. So flesh that out a little bit more then, because yeah. I was so I was thinking you were a chaplain. You're not. That's fine. My my misunderstanding. Uh, but you said you were a pastor. So what's the difference between being a pastor and a chaplain then? Well, I, I pastored it as far as function, and okay. what I mean by that is because sometimes when you're in like deployed, um, they don't have enough chaplains in the army to go around, mm -hmm. if you will. There, there's just too many soldiers, and and also too like sometimes the chaplains that the army has. They're not certi I don't want to use the word certified, but they don't they don't they come from a certain tradition. For instance, like they may be a Catholic chaplain. Mm -hmm. Right. And but if you go to like a like charismatic Pentecostal type of a service, the Catholic chaplain might not be able to run it the way he or she wants to run it because they're not from that tradition. Yeah. So what the army does is they, they take people like me who are ordained or, you know, or, you know, a licensed minister. And what they do is they say, we'll accept you at, we'll let you come on as a, like a lay minister mm -hmm. and we'll let you kind of run the service or take the service over or sometimes preach. But my case, they're like, Hey, you're the, you're the gospel service pastor, even though I wasn't a chaplain, but I was a lay min minister who served as that. So, gotcha. okay. Yeah. And so, and, and the chaplain who was over it, like he would only come in like maybe like twice a month and he would preach and that's really all he would do. And he would shake people's hands and as they left. But as yeah. far as running that particular service, that was on me for like the six months that I was in charge of it. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah, I didn't know. I wasn't sure if chaplains could have weapons uh, in the field or not. Because I mean, no, chaplains they don't. are They're considered non-combatives. Yeah. OK. And so chaplains, though, do go. They, I mean, they go on tour, right? They're there. Absolutely. On, yeah. OK. Yeah. They get deployed just like everybody else. They just yeah. they're just non-combatives. Gotcha. So, you know, and the whole reason that the, at least the army came up with it is so they could they could give the last rights to the soldiers who died. I mean, that, that was the whole point of the army coming up with it. Gotcha. And then obviously their duties evolved into, OK, now you got, you know, like PTSD and you got all these different like things that happen to soldiers why they're over there. So, you know, who counsels a lot of that? Yeah. And so the chaplain duties expanded dramatically because now it's not just, you know, giving last rights, but it's, you know, providing pastoral care. It's providing counseling. It's providing all these different things that soldiers go through in the whole year that sometimes even longer. Because when I was over there, the Army got really into the whole, we're going to extend your tour from 12 months to 15 months. Mm -hmm. So on my second tour, that actually happened. So, I mean, when soldiers have to be over there in war that long, like uh, mentally, it messes with you. So oh, the chapel bet. duties expanded to like to provide pastoral care to help support all that. Gotcha. No, that's very helpful because, like I said, I mean, I'm sure some people probably, I'm probably one of the least knowledgeable people of of the military as far as kind of the function and how things are. So no, no problem. Probably, that's what, really that's what I'm here to do. I mean, I'm yeah, I'm here to educate, and because people have all kinds of questions, and you know, what's the difference between pastor and chaplain? I'm like, well, nothing really. <clears throat> um, it's just, but how how's the function? I mean, I wasn't a chaplain, but as a lay minister, lay mentor or not mentor minister, they allowed me to be a pastor even though I wasn't a chaplain. Yeah. So, yeah, no, that's good. Cool. Well, I appreciate, I appreciate you sharing that. All right. So Joe, back to your channel a bit. Uh, you mentioned, sure. uh, you talk about a lot of different things and one in particular subject you like to talk about, especially the health, wealth, prosperity gospel is tithing. Why, oh, why yeah. don't you help us out a little bit? And I know you've talked on other channels as well about that subject. Why don't you help out us believers? I'm sure there's unbelievers that listen to there. Everybody's welcome. Uh, but what does it mean to tithe or not tithe? How should we be interacting with our money uh, today? Yeah, well, absolutely. Well, first of all, I, I tell people that, you know, the Malachi 3 passage where it says, you know, well, a man robbed God, but you have robbed me, mm. you know, but how how we robbed you, God, in tithes and offerings and, and the prosperity gospel, boy, they love them some Malachi 3. <laughs> um, and it's like, that's like the mother of all tithing scriptures. Unfortunately, they don't teach all the other tithing scriptures. They just really teach Malachi three yeah. for the most part. And so when I tell people Malachi three doesn't apply to us, and then I go into why, 
Because it's more than just, well, that was Old Testament. We live in a New Testament now. Yeah, that's part of it. But there's so many other reasons as to why. A, a lot of people get upset because they're like, see, you're telling not to give to the church anymore. I'm like, no, yeah. that's not what I'm saying. <laughs> um, I believe in New Testament free will sacrificial giving. As the Lord has blessed you, because it says in 1 Corinthians 16, give according to the way the Lord has prospered you. Mm. Um, for instance, I'm not a millionaire. So if the Lord doesn't bless me with that, I will never give a million dollars because I don't have it. <laughs> right. So sure. you, you, you give according to your, the way the Lord has your, given you according to your ability, if you will. And you give sacrificially. Now for some people that may 10% may be, that is sacrificing for them. That is a, you know, that's something all they can do for some people. If they can only give two or 3%, give according, again, give according to your ability. There's no compulsion there there's no curse there there's no you know god's disappointed with you there there is, my point is there's freedom in christ mm, okay okay where the spirit of the lord is there's liberty now granted in, this, in context that wasn't talking about tithing i don't think but the, the principle is there like if you're in christ there's no condemnation yeah so there is freedom in christ and so i do believe in giving so a, a lot of pastors are really against what I'm saying, either one, because they don't believe it, or two, they're afraid of teaching it because they're afraid that the, the numbers are going to go down in their offerings now. Yeah. And I'm like, no. I'm like, well, first of all, <laughs> if you teach people how to love, because love is more than just something you say, love is something that you do. Mm -hmm. And if you truly do love, and if you, you should want to give, you should want to bless, you should want to help, you should want to see soul saved in, the, in you know God's kingdom, his way of doing things on the earth, and you should want to see people blessed. Yeah. Um, and by the way, that was the context people, when people do talk about like giving scriptures, they talk about, you know, second Corinthians nine for God loves a cheerful giver. Right. Yeah. Well, that offering in context was taken to help out the, the poor saints that were in Judea or in Jerusalem. So that whole giving there was to help somebody else for the benefit of somebody else to bless and to love on somebody else. Yeah. Um, so, you know, so if we really do love people, actually the giving, if based upon our ability, should go up. Um, so oh, I tell absolutely. People, yeah, for sure. Yeah. So I tell people all the time, please, you know, if you can give 10%, do so. And if you can give more, do more. Yeah. Hallelujah. As long as the Lord is leading you to do more and you can, by all means, you know, 10% is the minimum. But for some people, 10% might be too much based upon where they are. Mm. So again, you have to be led of the Lord. And this is give according to the way that, that the Lord has prospered, but also give according to how you purposed in your heart, right? So if you want to give 50% and you can do that, then do so. I mean, praise God. You know, tithing is just a floor, if you will. But for some people, tithing may be too much based upon where they are. So again, there's freedom in Christ. But yeah, so tithing in Malachi 3, I tell people that doesn't apply to us anymore. And since, like I said, since we said earlier, I came out of the prosperity gospel, health and wealth. To them and tithing, that goes hand in hand. Mm -hmm. So when you say Malachi three doesn't apply anymore, oh my God, you're going to get a fight. You're going to get a fight on your hand like nobody's business. Um, but I've been free. I, I got, I've been free from this, you know, tithing mandate doctrine pretty much ever since I came out of the movement in like 2011. Mm. Um, so I've been a New Testament free will sacrificial, you know, for God loves a cheerful giver. I've been doing it that way ever since like 2011, 2012. Yeah. And I have so much more freedom in Christ. It's just yeah, the burden, no, the no. weight, the, the condemnation. I mean, I, I even know of some churches, if they're not tithing, they, they won't even be let them be leaders in, in the leadership. I mean, it, it's that wow. legalistic. Wow. Um, and I, I shared this with April Chapman and Standard Truth, Standard Truth channel. <laughs> um, I shared this on her channel where I actually got threatened, basically, because I posted some like meme about tithing on Facebook. And the church leadership saw it and they basically threatened me saying, you know, Joe, we're not here to hear your position. Basically, we're just we just want to know, you know, can you do what we're asking you to do? And if not, then we need to reevaluate you in leadership here. Hmm. Wow. And, yeah. Meaning. And so you're but you're advocating more than 10 percent. And they were scared that you're doing that. Therefore, it's going to remove the 10 percent right. and people will give less. The problem, though, is, right. I mean, my understanding, most people don't give even 10 percent. That's they my don't. understanding. Most they people don't. give far less, even if they are they're able to give more. Right. Um, I, I read, I don't know how accurate it is, but you know, like the Barna group, they do like these right. surveys and this was now granted, this was probably like 10 years or so ago. And they said only like 14 to 20% of Christians actually tithe. Yeah. So if that's even remotely accurate, that means like 80% of Christians aren't doing it anyway. 
Yeah. So, so I, I, I turned that argument on their head, though. I said, OK, pastors, if that survey is remotely accurate, then why are you coming up against me for taking that away? Because you're doing it and obviously they're not doing it anyway. <laughs> so it, right. it ain't like you're losing anything because if that survey is correct, they're not doing what you're teaching anyway. Yeah. Yeah. So why don't you just teach them the truth? You know, that that's my argument. But yeah. Hmm. But a lot of a lot of pastors, I feel, are afraid that if you stop teaching tithing, then the offering will go down or two, they really do believe it's God's word. And therefore, they're afraid of not teaching it because they're afraid if they're going to they're somehow not holding the biblical truth or biblical standard. So you do have those and, and those. You know, those pastors, I, I applaud because at least they're they're trying and they're, they're trying to stand on the word of God. Yeah. I, I believe they're, they're they're misrepresenting it, but at least they're trying to stand on the word of God based upon where they're at and what they know. Um, but then you just have others that are just, they're just scared that the offering will go down. And to some churches, that's a and for some pastors who are like, you know, money lovers, mm-hmm. that's a real problem because they want that money to come in because, you right. know, they want the jets and they want the cars and the houses and all that. So they're going to keep preaching tithing because well even if only 80 percent you know 80 20 percent of the people do it that's 20 percent the money's coming in right yeah. so right. you know but i you know but i i don't i don't tell people to stop giving and that's one of the, the things people have misrepresented of me when i say stop tithing and give new testament they automatically think that i'm not a giver anymore and i'm against giving no i'm not i'm forgiving i just want to do it the right and biblical way based upon the new testament now that's all i'm saying yeah as opposed to what we're preaching and teaching that it is you know it was never 10 percent of your income or 10 percent of your paycheck to begin with so yeah why don't, you flesh, why don't you flesh that out a little bit and we'll we'll wrap up with that How, how's it okay going? sure so when it says you know you have robbed me in tithes and offerings tithe, the tithes and offerings was 10 percent of the livestock and the produce of the land um, now that changes a lot because I've been in a lot of churches where they say, well, what for those who do preach on tithing, which, by the way, I've never been in a church yet that didn't. So yeah. maybe that's just me and my limited solo ness, but our silo, so, excuse me, silo ness. But um, there's always a big debate in these Christian circles. Well, do you tithe on your gross or your net? Right. Because of the whole yeah. tax situation. Right. And I'm like, you do realize that tithing was food and livestock. So it was it was always on your net. For instance, if you got 100 apples, you tithe 10. You can't tithe on something that did, you never got in. You can't right. tithe on something that doesn't exist. Right. Right. So there is no like tax system where, you know, you tithe on your gross and net. That's just something that we have to wrestle with because of our tax system. Yeah. But when you realize it's, 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 you know, or if you got a, you know, 10, if you got a hundred lambs, you give 10 of your best lambs. Cause again, you have to tithe, you know, no animals with spot and blemishes and all that. You couldn't tithe that, which by the way, Malachi chapter one says all that. Mm. When you read Malachi chapter one is God was basically rebuking the priest. And he says, if you think this is, you know, all this Remember, he says, if I'm really your God, where is my honor? And then he says, if you're really doing this, he's like, why don't you present this stuff to your governors and your leaders and see if they'll take it? Mm-hmm. Meaning they were doing it, but God wasn't receiving it because they were offering, the, you know, the the lame and the and the, ble- the blemished animals and all the all the stuff that God didn't want. He commanded them. He's like, look, when you give to me, give to me your best. Don't give to me that stuff. Yeah, that makes sense. So it was food and livestock. It was never your income. As a matter of fact, there's a scripture I want to say it's in Deuteronomy. If you were if you were tithing, you came from a faraway country. What you would do is you would bring your money because you, it's hard to like you know carry ten animals and carry them thirty miles or whatever, right? Sure, yeah. So what they did is they said just bring your money, make your travel, but then when you get to the place where you're supposed to tithe, take the money and then buy the tithe, meaning buy your food, buy your livestock, buy your whatever, and then tithe the stuff you bought. Yeah. So it was still never tithing money. That was never, ever, ever what the tithe was. Hmm. Now, some may argue, well, yeah, Joe, but back in biblical days, you know, if you were a farmer and you had great herds and if you had great, you know, harvest, that was a sign of your wealth. Mm-hmm. And that's true. I, I don't have a problem with that. The Bible says that Abraham was rich and then it goes, says how many cattle and all that they had. It's like, OK, I agree with you. But here's the problem with that. If you use that as your standard, then I say, okay, what was the purpose for tithing then? Why, why do you tithe? If, they, if that's your argument, then why do, why did they tithe? And it wasn't so they could finance the sanctuary. 
-hmm. It was because in Numbers chapter 18, the, the Levites were not allowed to own any land when they came into the promised land. And so when you look at, so when I tell people all the time, you know, you guys quote Malachi 3 all the time, you know, well, a man robbed God. But if God's going to say that to them, what is the origin of that command? It can't be Malachi 3 because Malachi 3, God is saying, I'm rebuking you because you guys ain't doing it, right? Right. So therefore, there had to have been a law or a command prior to that before Malachi 3. Right. So I tell people, I ask people, what is the original command from God to, to tithe? And it's found in Numbers chapter 18. And God basically said, you're going to tithe because when the Levites come into the promised land, they're not going to have a land inheritance. Right. So, so when they came into the promised land, all the... All the tribes of Israel got their land. That was the whole infamous, you know, Caleb says, give me my mountain, right? Right. So everybody got their land, but the Levites did. So the Levites, the, so they got their food and livestock off, off of other people because they didn't have their own land to, to grow their own crops and have their own herds. So the whole tithing system there in Numbers 18 was for the Levites who went to the promised land who could not own their, their, own, their own land. Well, all that stuff that I just said, doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> like all of it. Um, so when I tell people that they're like, okay, I hear you, but, and then, they, then they get stuck in their traditional way of, well, this is the way we've always done church. And this is since this is the way we've always done it. Then it has to be the truth. And then, and then I go back to the gospel. <laughs> That's a dangerous way to live. <laughs> right. And I'm like, you do sound like the people that Jesus rebuked. It says, you know, your elders are stuck in your traditions. Yeah. It's like, do you realize that Jesus, if he were alive on the earth today, because we know he's still alive, but if he were on the earth today, he could be saying the same thing about you right now. Yeah. Um, so anyway, I, I took a long way of answering that, but anyway, no, no, I that's I, good. I hope I answered it. I mean, obviously you've studied it and it is you know part of your background. And so especially the abuse there of the, uh, yeah. and the health, wealth preachers and prosperity gospel, which is probably I, I wouldn't say I mean, you might disagree and people can in the comments too but uh i don't think it's the biggest threat but it's still probably top three threat to just biblical normal christianity in yeah. the sense that you look at this and you're like that's not what <laughs> you know the joel osteens and the creflo dollars of the world right and it's just it's 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 astounding. I don't think that's the biggest threat. It's I think it's still a big threat. Um, well, I would say in the I'd say the '90s and early 2000s, it was bigger than what it is now. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thankfully, but I say thankfully though with some trepidation because to your point, other things have rose up now. You know, with yeah. that, so yeah. it's still there, but you have other things on the the front burner now. Yeah, um, but it, I'd say in the late '90s and early 2000s, oh, the health and wealth was just crazy. Yeah, and, and and it's hard. This is what's hard, Richard, because when you come up against it, people think that oh, you don't want God's people to be blessed. Yeah. No, that's that's not what I'm saying. So when you fight against it, people fight against you because they think that you don't want God's people to be blessed. Right. And I'm like, that's not what I'm saying. I don't have a problem with Christians being millionaires as long as they did it God's way and God blessed them and Amen. Yeah. But to sit there and have this entitlement, you know, I'm a, I'm a child of the King and therefore God owes me because I'm his kid type of thing. Yeah. Um, that's just <laughs> pride, arrogance, entitlement, hot mess. Yeah, right. No, that's, that's a, yeah. Anytime you, anytime anybody has the, I deserve or God owes me blank. Yeah. It, you're, you're in for a rude awakening. Right. Uh, for sure. So no, that's, yeah, I, I heard TD Jakes years ago say, you know, one of the reasons I give some, well, he, I don't know if he said giving, but he's like, basically one of the reasons I do what I do is, you know, so basically so I can make a demand on God. Wow. Huh? Wow. Right. I, I didn't, I didn't know that we could boss God yeah. around. Like that. Yeah. But well, it's, yeah. it's not just TD Jakes, it's Creflo Dollar. It's, that's kind of like my spiritual tree. When I came out of it, like I had my bishop and then my bishop's spiritual father was Creflo Dollar. His spiritual father was Kenneth Copeland and his spiritual father was Kenneth Aiken Sr. slash Oral Roberts. Yeah. So that was my family tree. Um. So, yeah. So when I say I was ordained as an elder in the movement, like, yeah. And, wow. and I could even tell you how, if you want to, I mean, some of the stuff that they said to kind of groom me to be the yeah. next guy, if you want, I could talk about that too. Yeah. Um, 
So I was at a conference with my bishop. Now, again, this was 2007. So I don't want to accuse them of this is what they believe now because they may not. Might change, yeah. But back in 2007, I went to my bishop's conference. And at the time, his church was about 1,200 members. And he had a spiritual son who eventually became my spiritual father. And he's like, this is this is another thing. Word of faith, prosperity preachers, they really have a weird sense of the definition of covenant okay. to where they believe the covenant gets bigger as the covenant goes along. Meaning they're like, Joe, you know, Abraham, you know, had a son and then, you know, his son had two sons and then they eventually had Jacob and he had 12 sons. So, you know, the covenant gets bigger as it goes down. You know that, Joe, right? And I'm like, OK. So they're like, so, you know, Joe, like, you know, you know, Bishop, he's got like, you know, 1200 members, you know, so I'm going to have like, you know, say 4,000 members and Joe, you're going to have 8,000 members. Yeah. Wow. And I'm like, okay. (laughs) And then, so what happens is, is so then, so then when they have like their conference and they start preaching and teaching, what they do is they start passing the mic, the microphone around Hmm. and they'll say, so the Bishop will prophesy. And then my father in the faith, he took the mic and then he started prophesying and then later on in the hotel room, I, I said, Dad, I said, you know, when, when you guys were doing that, like there was something in me that wanted to take the mic, too. And he's like, he's like, yeah, he's like, yeah, son. Yeah, Joe, you should have took the mic, too. And he said, because when you get up there and you prophesy and you take the mic, he said, that way you can get your face before the people. Mm. So the people can see you and they can hear you and they can get to know who you are. And so when I went to my bishop's church and I did preach there, like I had my own armor bearer. And they carried my, you know, my, my blazer, they carried my Bible, they carried my water, my juice, whatever I wanted, what have you. Wow. So, I, so when I went to that church, like they, they rolled out the red carpet for me and, and, and it was well known. Like that's, you know, that's the Bishop's spiritual grandson right there. Mm. And it was well known, like who I am. Um, and they were kind of grooming me to be that, to be that guy. And I say that to say this, like, like these, you know, wolves and false prophets and false teachers, they're not just in a vacuum, like they're made, like mm. they are networked and they're groomed to become that. And they get their face and their voice in front of certain people. And those certain people take them under their wing and they groom them to be the next guy. Mm. Um, and th- in the very, very beginning stages of it, that's kind of how it started with me as well. And they were starting to slowly but surely groom me to be one of those guys too. So that's, that's how they do it. Wow. No, bro. I appreciate you sharing. That's, that's, it's one of those, like you suspect it, you know, even when you see like late night TV or the, you know, the so-called comedians of late night or whatever, or even just the mainstream media in general, where they'll talk about a particular story or a particular Mm -hmm. thing. And it all has the same words and they, and the anchors, you know, say the same thing. And, it's fairly obvious and i think they've been doing it in politics probably a lot longer too where you know this party says this and when it's a response for this you do this and yeah applause uh, i mean we (laughs) saw this with katanji brown jackson and i'm convinced even looking at i just did a video um uh, recently with it and how some yeah i loved it too i put some comments in there yeah oh thanks bro uh some of these pastors they're just they're just shamelessly worshiping this woman right because of her skin tone and her gender it's like How are you not showing partiality? But they're saying the same things. And that's what's very strange in one sense. And I don't think it's organic in the sense of just cropping up. But I I, I would go out on a limb, you know, conspiracy wise and say that they've been told this by X, Y, Z, you know, other person. Hey, so and so say this. Hey, so and so say that. Because there were several even, you know, the triumphal entry and using Palm Sunday and how she's like Jesus. And you're just like. She's just like, Jesus, I'm sorry. Wait, what? Like, it's just, yeah. So it seems like that is probably very prevalent. And I, I'm not surprised to hear yeah, that. Yeah, that's with exactly how it is. It's, too, so. To your point, either if they were told that, if that or a lot of people have the same mindset. Yeah. And then what you'll see is these same mindset churches, are, they'll, they'll start networking together. Yeah. And then what happens is, is you just basically get passed around. So when they have their like conferences and stuff like that, it's the same pastors and the same people in the same conferences. They just kind of circulate the field, yeah. if you will. And they all preach at each other's conferences. So they're, they're all getting the same 
wolfy teaching or the same wolfy belief because you got the same wolves preaching in this, each other's conferences. Right. And that's how they network. And that's how they get their name out there and their face out there. And before you know it, they become famous because they're all in the same preacher circuit. Mm-hmm. So to your point about the Brown Jackson, if you get all the same pastors feeling the same way, then we'll just get all the same pastors feeling the same way. We'll be on our Brown Jackson conference tour, if you will, just yeah. to use an example. And then that's how these little pods get started. And then those pods just travel all around the country. And that's how they influence everybody. Yeah. No, it makes sense. I mean, in all the weird ways, it makes sense. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, no, I appreciate your time, brother. You got any last last uh, comment or thought you want to share with us? Yeah, just if people can find me on my channel, it's called uh, Walking Through the Scriptures with Joseph Bahoda. Um, I just changed the name to that about a couple months ago so people can find me better. Also, too, on the Walking Through the Scriptures, I actually have a link in my about to my own website. Yeah. So if you just click on that link, it'll take you to my website. You can see the picture of me and my family. If you want to know more about me, kind of my background, uh, a lot of my videos are on there. I have some devotionals and stuff on there, too. So please feel free to check out my channel, Walking Through the Scriptures. And uh, just check out my YouTube uh, channel as well so that we can get to know me a little bit better. Yeah, no, absolutely. I urge everybody to, to do that. Uh, again, thanks for the time, brother, and uh, sharing your story. And yeah, you got a lot to say, a lot of experience. And praise God, it's Christ saved you from this and then moved you in a far more mature direction out of that whole word faith. Uh, yeah silliness so that's yeah cool. absolutely just the, and just the whole like I said the journey and you know what you have to give up in one end to grab onto the, the something better over here yeah um uh, it's been a journey and um yeah. but I, but i thank god for it i wouldn't trade it for anything as far as just you know just walking in the truth of his word amen well again i appreciate appreciate the time and thanks everybody for listening watching and uh take care have a great day